The strange but true story featured on this podcast contains details some people may find distressing. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Chaya Samuel and things are about to get weird. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. If you're new here, this is a podcast dedicated to some of the strangest stories you're ever likely to hear, from true crime and unsolved mysteries to astonishing coincidences and tales full of bizarre twists. I'm joined today by the ambiance of rain on my window. It's late August when I'm recording this, and for some reason the skies have opened, well I say for some reason the skies have opened, it's because I live in the UK, clearly. But if you can hear a noise, it's the rain. I guess it adds to the atmosphere of a strange but true story anyway. You probably can't even hear it, but it kind of feels a little bit spooky in here right now. Today's episode is all about the inconceivable survival story of flight attendant Vesna Velovich, the sole survivor of JAT Flight 367 and the holder of the Guinness World Record for surviving the highest fall without a parachute. Get ready for this. 33,330 feet, or if you're into meters, 10,160 metres. This is one of the most unbelievable stories I've ever heard. Obviously, the story features details of a plane crash, so please do be warned. But other than that, let's get into the story. If you're wondering how I arrived at this topic, here's a little bit of a backstory. So in general, I think that people do have this kind of morbid fascination with air disasters. You know, you see those documentaries on TV and it's like top 10 air crashes of all time and you're like, top 10? It's a weird thing to rank. I actually did used to have a relatively big fear of flying. It all stemmed from one bad flight when I was arriving into Menorca and there was quite a bit of turbulence at the end of the flight. There was nothing wrong, it was just normal turbulence, but it really freaked me out. And after that, I was a little bit like, ooh, but I knew that I was gonna have a big flight ahead. I was gonna be going from London to Hong Kong and I thought to myself, I need to sort this out before this flight because I don't wanna be in a state of anxiety for 14 hours or however long it was. So I actually went to hypnotherapy and it really did the trick. I'm quite chilled about flying now, but sometimes when I'm on a plane, I do still have those thoughts like, oh my God, we're in a tin can floating through the air. I know it's a lot more involved than that, but you get what I mean. Anyway, all of that considered, when I stumbled across this story, I think the reason it hooked me in so much is one, it is unbelievable. But two, I had that past experience of having this big fear of flying and it kind of comes into play later in the story. You'll see. Just a quick historical note. In this episode, I do talk about Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. Obviously, what I mean is former Yugoslavia and former Czechoslovakia. But during the time that this episode takes place, that is what those areas were known as. But let's introduce the star of this story, Vesna Vilovic. I really hope that I'm pronouncing her surname anywhere near close to the correct pronunciation. I'm doing my best. Vesna was born on January the 3rd, 1950 in Belgrade. Her dad was a businessman and her mum was a fitness instructor. Now, not a huge amount is actually known about her early life, but from what I read, she loved the Beatles. And this actually drove her to want to improve her English language skills. And I know that music is an absolutely huge factor in a lot of people wanting to learn a language. If they love a band or an artist who sings in that language, it can definitely be a massive motivator. And it certainly was for Vesna. When Vesna was an adult, she briefly moved to the US before moving to Stockholm in Sweden. But her parents weren't massively happy. They thought that Stockholm was full of, quote, drugs and sex, and wanted her to return to Serbia. Vesna did actually return back home, but once she was there, all she could think about was this desire that she had to move to London. And she actually decided to become a flight attendant because the idea of being able to visit London each month even if it was for work, was absolutely thrilling to her. Plus, Vesna had a friend who was already a flight attendant and she loved how her friend looked in her uniform, which I think is an iconic reason to want to choose a career path. I love it. 
When you look back at a lot of the photos of Vesna that are available from the 70s, you can kind of tell that she has this glamorous side to her. In lots of the photos, her hair is perfectly styled, it's blonde, she's got this twiggy vibe about her, she's got these huge eyes with really nicely done makeup, and there is a picture of her that I've seen where she's wearing her flight attendant outfit, and she looks really proud to be wearing it, it really suits her, and you can kind of tell that she felt in her element. Yugoslavia's biggest airline at the time was called JAT. I've also seen it called Yugoslav Airways as well, and Vesna joined the company in 1971. There's not a massive amount to note about her first year working there, but then the 26th of January 1972 rolls around. So the day before the 25th, Vesna and her colleagues had arrived in Copenhagen. She was due to be working aboard JAT flight 367, which was going from Stockholm to Belgrade with stopovers in Copenhagen and Croatia. This is a bit confusing, but I guess because they were the secondary crew, they were in Copenhagen ready to board the flight once it arrived on its stopover in Denmark from Sweden the next day. Although Vesna was now officially scheduled to be working on flight 367, initially she wasn't supposed to be working on it at all. She'd been mixed up with another attendant called Vesna, but she was super excited to visit Denmark as she'd never been before, so she took the shift. Vesna has said that the day before and the morning of the flight, she noticed something really odd about the rest of the crew, and this is actually quite chilling. It's a direct quote. She said, "'Everybody wanted to buy something for his or her family.'" so I had to go shopping with them. They seemed to know that they would die. They didn't talk about it, but I saw and I felt for them. And the captain was locked in his room for 24 hours. He didn't want to go out at all. In the morning, during breakfast, the co-pilot was talking about his son and daughter as if nobody else had a son or daughter. Ooh, I've actually got goosebumps. Flight 367 departed from Stockholm Arlanda Airport at 1.30pm on the 26th of January. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas DC-9 and it landed at Copenhagen Airport at 2.30pm. In Copenhagen, Vesna and her crew boarded the flight and it took off on its onward journey as normal. However, 46 minutes after takeoff, the worst thing you could imagine happened. There was an explosion which tore through the baggage compartment and caused the plane to literally break apart. This happened as they were flying over a tiny village in Czechoslovakia. It's called Serbska Kamenjais. Now, obviously, you know that Vesna survived because I kind of spoiled it in the intro, but when you hear the details about the plane literally breaking into pieces, it seems absolutely unimaginable that anyone would have survived. Of the 28 passengers and crew aboard the plane, Vesna was the only survivor. I'm sure the question that's been on your mind since the very start of this episode is, how does a human being survive a plane crash where a bomb has been detonated, the plane has broken into pieces, and it has fallen over 33,000 feet out of the sky? The answer isn't necessarily straightforward, but it begins with one of the most basic essentials aboard a plane investigators concluded that Vesna had been trapped by one of the plane's food carts, which pinned her in the fuselage, which is the main tube of the aircraft. Whilst all of the other people on board the plane were horrifically ejected out of the plane once it depressurized, because Vesna was pinned by the cart, it means she was stuck in the main body of the plane and she went down with the largest part of the wreckage. It seems strange enough that a food cart would be the reason that Vesna was trapped in the optimum position to even stand a chance of being able to survive a crash like this, but it actually wasn't the only factor in her survival. This story only gets weirder. The fuselage part of the plane landed at an angle in a really heavily wooded and snow-covered mountainside, which kind of helped to soften the impact. This was incredibly lucky for Vesna. The chances of that big part of the plane landing in an area like that are so small, but that's not all. Okay, this is a little bit graphic, but normally an impact like this would be enough to cause a person's heart to burst on impact, which is so grim. But not only did Vesna get pinned in the right part of the plane, land on a relatively cushioned part of the ground, but a medical condition which should have actually prevented her from becoming a flight attendant in the first place actually helped to save her life that day. 
Thursda had a history of really low blood pressure and she was only able to pass her medical to become cabin crew because she drunk loads of coffee before the test. Basically, she had passed out after the cabin depressurized and all of these things helped to prevent her heart from bursting. Is that not the most wild set of circumstances you have ever heard? Okay, let's backtrack slightly. You're probably wondering why the plane literally exploded. I'll be brief as it's a complex story and I have loads more to tell you about Vesna. But during this time, there had been a large number of terror attacks carried out by Croatian nationalists against Yugoslavian civilians and military. And this is believed to be one of them. Another bomb was actually detonated on a train traveling between Vienna and Croatia on the same day as the crash. Someone did claim responsibility, but no arrests were ever made. This is interesting though. Vesna did say, this is another quote from her, I saw all the passengers and crew deplane. So obviously she means when the plane originally landed in Copenhagen. One man seemed terribly annoyed. It was not only me that noticed him either. Other crew members saw him, as did the station manager in Copenhagen. I think it was the man who put the bomb in the baggage. I think he had checked in a bag at Stockholm, got off in Copenhagen and never reboarded the flight. So after the plane had crashed down, Vesna was discovered amongst the wreckage by a local man with one of the best names I've ever heard, Bruno Honk. I'm sure it's not Honk, it's probably Honke or Honker. H-O-N-K-E, but I like Honk. He'd been a medic in World War II and after he'd heard her screaming for help, he kept her alive until further help could arrive. She was covered in blood and I'm sure completely in shock. I have no clue how he would have heard her screaming. All I can imagine is that he must have obviously heard the crash happen as it was so near to this village or within this village. And he must have headed there straight away, which is obviously a very brave thing to do in itself. Vesna had some awful injuries, as I'm sure you can imagine, so brace yourselves. This is the list of her injuries. It's awful. Two broken legs, three broken vertebrae, a fractured pelvis, several broken ribs, and a skull fracture, which then hemorrhaged, and she had to be put into a coma for days. She was also paralysed from the waist down too, but thankfully this was actually temporary. The psychological effects were also really severe. She had amnesia, which lasted from the period of an hour before the crash to about a month afterwards, which I think is probably a good thing, really. If any of us were given the option to either remember or not remember the details of something even remotely as traumatic as this, I'm sure most of us would choose not to remember it because not only would Vesna have had that fear within herself before she did pass out, she must have seen and heard some of the most horrific things you could humanly imagine. There were 27 people who did not survive this plane crash. As I said before, they would have been ejected from the plane. I can't imagine what was observed aboard that aircraft. And I feel like it's a mercy that Vesna wouldn't have been able to recall those memories due to the amnesia. Her parents said that she didn't actually learn about the accident for about two weeks afterwards, which I guess was due to the coma plus the amnesia that she experienced. And when she did, she actually had to be sedated. Her last memory from before the crash was greeting passengers as they boarded the plane. And the next thing she remembered was seeing her parents in the hospital a month later. I can't stop thinking about what Vesna's parents must have experienced because not only did they have that moment of hearing that this plane had crashed and thinking, is that the plane that Vesna's on? Getting confirmation that it was the plane Vesna was on, you would just automatically assume that your loved one was gone. But she wasn't. I, I can't imagine the emotional roller coaster that they experienced. It's, it's out of this world. In the end, Vesna made almost a complete recovery, but she was said to still walk with a limp. Imagine surviving all of that and only having a limp at the end of it, in terms of physical injuries anyway. I mean, I limp a bit after I've stubbed my toe, let alone falling 33,330 feet and surviving a plane crash. In 2008, Vesna said, nobody ever expected me to live this long. She credited her Serbian stubbornness and a childhood diet that included chocolate, spinach and fish oil for making such an amazing recovery. So what happened to Vesna after this ordeal? 
Well, first of all, she had absolutely no issue with flying again. Not a hoot was given. In fact, she wanted her old job back at JAT, but they eventually put her into a desk role where she negotiated flight contracts as they felt that she was too well known. She had actually become a hero and a celebrity in Yugoslavia and they probably didn't want passengers thinking about what she'd experienced as they're about to take off. It probably wouldn't have been the best idea. And here's where the story loops back to what I was talking about in the intro about fear of flying and it being one of the reasons that I find this story so fascinating. As someone who's had a fear of flying, I cannot get my head around the fact that Vesna was so fine with it after going through what she went through. The strength that she must have had to go to her employer and say, I know I just went through that, but can I have my old job back? I, I don't, I don't get it. It's amazing. Despite being involved in something so tragic, being the sole survivor of an incident which killed 27 other people, including friends, colleagues, and people she was taking care of that day, Vesna did manage to have some positive experiences in her life after the crash. I wanted to tell you about them now before this story does take another sad turn. Vesna received a decoration from Yugoslav President Tito and a song which translates as Vesna the Stewardess was recorded by a Serbian folk singer called Miroslav Ilic. I really hope I've pronounced that right. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the name of the song. Am I gonna attempt it? Maybe I will. Vesna Stewardessa? Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I so wish that I was able to include a clip of the song. I just went and had a little listen to it before I started recording this episode. And although I don't know what the singer's saying, it just sounds great. So do feel free to look it up. It's quite widely available. I'll leave a link to it in the show notes for you. Remember my guy, Bruno Honk from before, the man who found Vesna alive after the crash? He had a granddaughter who was born six weeks after the ordeal. And his granddaughter was named Vesna. How sweet is that? Honestly, that made my heart very happy. As I say, Vesna was considered a national hero and after her 33,330 foot fall was officially recognised as a Guinness World Record, she was presented with a recognition of this by Paul McCartney at a gala in London. Remember from earlier in the story? Vesna was a huge fan of the Beatles. It's what inspired her to learn English in the first place. I feel like those two details about Bruno Honk's granddaughter and about her getting the recognition from Paul McCartney, when you hear something so traumatic that's happened to a person, but then there are those things that come out of it that are positive, you've got to grab onto those, haven't you? When you hear those just moments of light in an otherwise very dark time. In 1977, Vesna married a man called Nicola Brecker. He was a mechanical engineer and they got married after only a year of dating. Sadly, even though she was told that the injury she suffered in the crash wouldn't impact her reproductive system, she suffered an ectopic pregnancy after they married, which was almost fatal. And devastatingly for the couple, they were never able to have children. During the early 1990s, after taking part in anti-government protests during the breakup of Yugoslavia, Vesna was actually fired from JAT. However, she wasn't arrested as the government were worried it would bring negative attention. I mean, she was a national hero after all. Around the same time, she and Nicola sadly divorced and she said it actually came down to her chain smoking, which he really disapproved of. Vesna was very pro-democracy and she took part in loads of activism until the bulldozer revolution of October 2000, when the Socialist Party of Serbia were ousted from power. She actually took to Belgrade City Hall's balcony with a number of other celebrities to make victory addresses. I'm afraid there isn't a very happy ending to Vesna's story, which honestly breaks my heart, not just because of what she went through on that flight, but the way that she managed to live her life afterwards, standing up for what she believed in. She campaigned and advocated for Serbia's entry into the EU on behalf of the Democratic Party, and she just seemed like she was trying to use her status to really make a difference in the world. Vesna would go on to suffer massively with survivor's guilt, which I feel like is something that isn't always talked about in the aftermath of these stories, but none of us could really put ourselves in Vesna's shoes. The odds of her surviving were beyond 
minuscule. It must have been the most bizarre experience humanly imaginable. I think it's worth remembering that at the time of the crash, Vesna was only 23 years old. The weight of having to deal with what happened to you at the age of just 23 must have been such a heavy thing for Vesna to bear. Sadly, she actually refused therapy, which is such a shame as no one on this planet could be expected to deal with something like this alone, but she actually turned to religion and became a devout Orthodox Christian. Vesna's parents had died in the years soon after the crash, and she apparently spoke of the idea that the trauma of everything had ended her parents' lives prematurely. She began to really dislike talking about the fall, and she even declined to be interviewed by both Oprah and the BBC, as she simply didn't want to talk about it anymore. She was living on a tiny pension, about €300 a month, in a rundown, practically dilapidated apartment in Belgrade. On the 23rd of December 2016, Vesna was found lifeless in her apartment by locksmiths who had forced her door down. Her friends had stopped receiving phone calls from her and had become concerned, but sadly by the time entry was gained to her apartment, she was gone. Vesna was buried in Belgrade's new cemetery on the 27th of December 2016. What a story. Honestly, it's absolutely wild. I think for me, the thing that I can't get my head around is the perfect alignment of conditions which would have needed to happen for any human being to be able to survive that fall, the fact they all came together in one, the odds of it are so tiny, I can't even get my head around it. There is something else I wanted to mention, and this might just be the journalist in me coming out and I have to look at everything, but there was a conspiracy theory and you know how I feel about those, but I did want to mention this one because it is interesting. There was a conspiracy which surfaced in 2009, that claimed that Flight 367 had been accidentally shot down by the Czechoslovak Air Force after being mistaken for an enemy aircraft at around 2,600 feet. The theorists claimed that Vesna's story, or at least the part about the 33,330 feet, was a cover-up story. However, there was no real evidence for this claim, and it was presented by two Prague-based journalists who admitted that any evidence really was just circumstantial. Vesna did actually react to this theory, saying that due to her amnesia, she really couldn't shed any light on the claims either way. However, the theory never really went anywhere and Vesna's Guinness World Record stands solid. Personally, I don't think I believe this theory. Obviously, the investigation said that the explosion came from within the baggage compartment of the plane, so it would make a lot more sense that there was a bomb or a device within that compartment of the plane. As I say, no arrests were ever made for the bombing, although the Czechoslovak Civil Aviation Authority did publish a final report where they say the cause of the explosion came from a briefcase bomb. Additionally, now this is quite strange, The Guinness World Records website states that both black boxes that were present on board the aircraft were analysed by specialists from Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia and the Netherlands who confirmed that the plane had truly fallen from the stated height. Now, this stated height, from most things that I've researched, has been 33,330 feet and As I've been reading and going along, I kept thinking to myself, that's a lot of threes. But when you actually look on the Guinness World Records website, they actually state the height as 33,333 feet. So it's all threes, which seems really odd. I don't know, I'm sure it means nothing, but it's just so strange that there is that discrepancy between the vast majority of other sources and then the Guinness World Records website, why has it suddenly gone from 33,330, which is a lot of threes on its own, to then all threes in the official record? Really weird. I'm sure that anybody who's into spiritual things, supernatural, paranormal things, anything to do with numbers, Please tell me your thoughts on this because I'm trying not to go down a rabbit hole, but it is very odd. So if you have any thoughts about this, please do let me know. It's intrigued me. It's intrigued me and confused me. I thought that I would round off this episode by telling you about a few more people who have survived falls from absolutely ridiculous heights that you could never imagine a human being could live through. 
As I'm sure you've probably already guessed, for obvious reasons, a lot of stories of people falling from great heights involve them falling from an aircraft. And a lot of these stories do take place in World War II. There were several reports from that time where military personnel actually fell from or had to jump from a heavily damaged plane. So I'm going to tell you three of those stories today. Two of them don't involve a parachute. The third one kind of does. First up, we have the story of Flight Sergeant Nicholas Alchemade. He was a British tail gunner in the Royal Air Force during World War II. Nicholas was just 21 years old on the night of the 24th of March 1944, when the Avro Lancaster heavy bomber plane he was flying over Germany was attacked by a German night fighter aircraft. His plane then caught fire and began to spiral out of control. It didn't take long for Nicholas to realise that the parachute that he did have in the aircraft with him had caught fire. It was completely unusable. So he had to make a decision. The decision was either jump from the aircraft with no parachute and die on impact or burn to death in the plane that was literally on fire and he chose to jump. He fell 18,000 feet to the ground miraculously, and I wish there was more information available about this, because just to say this on its own sounds like it's something from a cartoon, like it sounds like something that couldn't actually happen in real life, but his fall was broken by pine trees, and the fact that these pine trees were located on ground, which had a very soft snow covering, you'd imagine that he had horrific injuries, even if his fall was broken by pine trees, but when he landed, he was able to move his arms and legs, and the worst physical injury that he suffered was a sprained leg. Unbelievable. Next up, we have the story of American Staff Sergeant Alan McGee, who was a member of the United States Army Air Force. On the 3rd of January 1943, Alan was in his Flying Fortress aircraft when it was attacked by German forces. During this attack, a section of the right wing of the plane was actually blown off and the plane went into this deadly spiral that Alan knew he wouldn't be able to survive. In the middle of this attack, Alan had realised that his parachute had been torn and would be completely useless to him. Whilst he was trying to move around the aircraft, he actually ended up completely passing out because of the lack of oxygen. The plane was at a very high altitude and he was actually thrown from the aircraft. This is wild, but Alan actually fell over four miles before landing on the roof of a railway station in the area of France over which he was flying. So the roof was made from glass and when Alan actually made contact with it, it completely shattered and this kind of absorbed the force of the impact. He was found on the floor of the station and miraculously once again, he was alive. He had 28 shrapnel wounds as well as several broken bones, damage to his lung and kidney, severe damage to his nose and eye and a nearly severed right arm. He did recover from this unbelievable ordeal though, and he actually passed away on December the 20th, 2003 at the age of 84. Finally, Ivan Chisov was a Soviet Air Force Lieutenant who survived a fall of around 7,000 meters or 23,000 feet. After German forces attacked the plane in which he was flying, he actually decided to leap from the plane. He did have a parachute and his plan was to not open it initially in case he made himself a target for any other German aircraft who were flying around. However, before he had chance to carry out his plan and open up his parachute, he actually passed out because of the altitude and he wasn't able to open it. Snow saves the day once again because Ivan actually landed at the edge of a snowy ravine which he then sort of slid and rolled down towards the bottom. The battle that was happening in the sky was actually being observed by soldiers who were on the ground, so when Ivan was seen falling towards earth, his fellow soldiers were able to find him and help him as quickly as they could. They were absolutely shocked to find that Ivan was actually alive and he was wearing his unopened parachute. As I'm sure we can all imagine, he sustained some really serious injuries that required surgery, including a broken pelvis and spinal injuries, but he was able to recover incredibly quickly and he was flying again three months later. I know those were three military examples, but I do have one that's non-military and it's about a lady called Julianne Diller and I actually want to keep her story for perhaps a later episode of Things Are About To Get Weird because again, it's unbelievable. But there we have it. That is the astonishing survival story of Vesna Volovich, the sole survivor of JAT Flight 367. 
Thank you so much for listening to the second ever episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. I wanted to give a little shout out to my sources for this episode. There was a BBC article from the 24th of December 2016. There was an article on Medium by History Vault and also Wikipedia too. Of course, I would love to know what you think about this story. Had you heard of Vesna before? Did you think it could ever even be possible that someone would survive not only a fall without a parachute from that height, but from a plane crash as well? There's lots of ways that you can get in touch with me. So we're on Instagram at Things Get Weird Podcast and Twitter is at About To Get Weird. And you can also use the hashtag Things Are About To Get Weird to have a little chat with me as well. If you have any of your own favourite strange but true stories that you'd love to hear featured on this podcast, you can pop me an email at thingsgetweirdpodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this episode, I would massively appreciate a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Episodes one and three are also live as well. So if you've not checked those out, feel free to go and have a little listen. And then from here on out, there'll be a new episode every Wednesday. Until next time, be sure to take care of yourself and others and keep it weird, but the good kind of weird. Thank you.